Hello fiber friends! Welcome to Vlogmas. Today we are opening box number five. I can't believe we're already at number five, but I'm very excited to open that box with you. I have a few housekeeping things, an announcement, and some other stuff that we're going to talk about very briefly first. Then we'll open the box and get spinning, hear our story, which I know you'll laugh today because I I couldn't stop laughing. I think today's story is um, very snarky <laughs> in its own way, but also kind of trying to be honest. Anyway, you'll see, it's funny. And then I wanna tell you about one of my upcoming projects. So let's get into it. We have a lot to talk about today. First of all, I wanted to remind you that we are having a giveaway so generously given to the channel by Lori and <laughs> get the box open. The giveaway is this box of Rolex from Wild Wolf Farms. This giveaway, the uh, winner will be announced tomorrow, which is Saturday. The way that you can enter that giveaway is to go to the previous video and leave a comment. Not this video, to be very, very clear, you need to leave a comment on Vlogmas day number four to enter that giveaway. Those are the comments that I will be selecting the winner from using a random comment selector. Then today, we have the beginning of another giveaway because, I mean, it's the season of giving. So we just need to do some giving. I am really excited for this giveaway. The first Vlogmas that we had in 2020, I gave away an Ashford traditional which I got, it was vintage, and I was able to give that away because it was a used wheel, and uh, we named that wheel Gale, and it was, it was a really special giveaway. So this year, I don't have another Gale, and I did look, but I couldn't find one. But this year, what I do have is something new and fancy. I am going to be giving away an Eel Wheel Nano 2. Now, I didn't want to announce this until I knew for sure that it was on its way. It hasn't arrived at my house yet, but I do have the shipping and tracking number. When that wheel arrives, I am going to open it up and test it and spin on it just a little bit. Maybe I'll do one of our Vlogmas spins. So keeping that in mind, but I already have an Eel Wheel Nano 1 and I got the upgrade kit for my Nano 1 and I don't need two Nanos. So that second one after I try it out, do a little demo, will be the giveaway overall for Vlogmas. So the way to enter that giveaway is to leave a comment on any of the Vlogmas videos starting with number five and going forward. Um, one, two, three, four won't count because I have to put the rules in there and people have to know if they're commenting and all of the rules and things like that. So five through 12, leave a comment and that will be your entry to win the Eel Wheel Nano. I will put a picture of it up on the community tab as soon as it arrives, so that will be really exciting. Hopefully later today it will be here. All right, so we took care of those things. Now let's open our Vlogmas box number five and get spinning and hear our funny <laughs> complaint and I think this story we're gonna read today is very relatable you'll have to let me know what you think um, and after that I will tell you a little bit about my next project my dress isn't quite finished I didn't have time to finish up the hemming yet so we'll see that in my next video but yeah let's open our box for today here it is box number five Ooh. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm so excited to show you all this fiber. Okay, so our blessing first is, may all your ends be woven in before the next sweater weather season. Who has a pile of stuff that they're not using because they didn't weave in the ends? <laughs> I have to finish this one. I still have some ends to weave. Just a few though, <laughs> not a whole lot. And then I'll be able to wear this with my linen dress in the next video, I'm hoping I'll have time to get it done. I have to make a confession. All of my hand knit socks, I weave in the ends on the cuff and the ones on the toe, I just pull it on the inside of the sock and I leave it that way. If you turn my socks inside out, there's just 
yarn hanging out, which I know it's not very great because you need to weave it in to secure, you know, the last stitch of it and everything. I just don't. <laughs> so, um, and my sweater that I made to go with my linen dress, I'm still working on the ends for that. I should work on that so that I can wear the dress and have the whole outfit, but um, yeah. <laughs> weave in your ends. Solidarity for those of us who that's not our favorite thing. All right, so let's get to this fiber. Here it is. Oh, and we have a fun, we have a fun extra bonus thing in here as well. I'll show you that first. Ha! It's a thing that the camera won't focus. There we go. It's a holographic vinyl sheep sticker. I love this little guy. So there he is, and I love him so much. All right, the fiber. This, you knew it was coming, right? We had our embers, and now we need some flames. So that is what we have. We have our fire going on here. Um, we have some browns like the wood. We have some oranges like the bottom of the flames. And we have some bright yellows. I hope you can see that in the fire behind me. <laughs> so I am going to fluff this one up. The uh, breed for this one is Targi. So it will be similar to the Polworth we had yesterday, but not quite exactly the same. So you'll have to let me know if you are spinning these along with me or if you've spun these breeds before, let me know what you think about the difference. But it really, really helps to floof out the floof noodles. And this is just about all floofed up. So how do we want to spin this? I am thinking, that what would go along with our story today is something portable and easy to travel with. That will make absolute sense when you hear our story. <laughs> um, so something portable and easy to travel with. I'm thinking that we should spin this with a spindle. That's my thought. And I'm wondering if we could do a fractal spin with spindles. That could be really cool. What if we just did a two-ply fractal? So how that would look, I'll use two spindles to do this. Um, so a two-spindle fractal is going to look like this. We're going to split one right in half. Here we go. So this will be on one spindle. And then we will take, and I'll just go top to bottom with this one, right? We'll start here and go straight through to the end. And then, and these colors kind of line up which, whichever way you go. We kind of have orange, yellow, brown, yellow, orange. So um, the other one, I am going to split this one in half again. And so when I spin, there we go. So then when I spin, Ah, there. Okay, there we go. So when I spin this one, I'll go like this and spin the thinner piece and then the other thinner piece. So what that means, if I kind of try and hold these up a little bit, that means, if you can see, that the thicker one is going to have longer color stripes and the thinner one is going to have shorter color stripes because there's less material to spread out into the yarn to make that color. And when I apply them together, it will have longer sections of this color and shorter sections of this color, and it looks really pretty. So that's my plan. What spindles am I going to use? Great question. Let me grab some spindles that are going to spin about the same as each other. Hmm, okay, I know what to use. I have an Enid Ashcroft top whirl spindle and I have a Vermont Spindles top whirl spindle and they have about the same rate of twist, which means I can spin about the same way. I'll get about the same yarn and equivalent levels of twist and that will be easier to ply together into one cohesive yarn. Do you have to do it that way? No. Also, you could use one spindle, you know, take one side of it off into a ball or 
center pull ball or whatever and then ply off of that when you spin the other part on the spindle that you just cleaned off. There are so many ways to do it. I get a lot of questions about, can I do it this way? Can I do it that way? My answer is always going to be, try it and see what happens. Experiment, explore. You will learn so many things. And don't worry about wasting the yarn because you're not. You're learning and that's never a waste. Also, the sheep are still growing wool. <laughs> so <laughs> there's plenty to go around. All right, let me grab my spindles and show you what those look like. Here they are. This one is Enid Ashcroft, and I don't remember exactly what the woods are on here. Um, I will look them up and editing Evie. <laughs> we'll put the text up here so that you know which has what wood. This one is the Vermont Spindles, and this one is Enid Ashcroft. They are both beautiful spindles. I love them a lot. They give me a lot of fast twist, and they spin for a while, so they're they're great for thinner, higher twist yarns. And I'm also going to use a distaff to hold my yarn while I'm spinning it. This is a ring distaff. And Roman distaffs were made in this form factor, the ancient, ancient Roman distaffs. The way it works is that you wrap your wool all around it so the bird gets to sit in a little nest of wool. And then you put your finger through it and hold it like this. So then you have your nest of wool here and you're able to spin from it without it coming down and dangling and getting caught up in your yarn and making a mess while you spin. So I wanted to give you a close-up detail of how that works before I put the wool on it because it gets a little bit hard to see what's going on. I do sell these in my shop. I have a link for my shop down below. Um, they are made by Katrinkles. And I think one of the really cool things about these is that they are unstained. And then over time, as you put wool on them, especially if it's wool you've processed yourself, the, um, the lanolin and oils from the wool kind of work their way into the wood and it becomes its own natural stain. And mine's doing that and I love it. I think it's so pretty. Um, yeah, so uh, I think at the moment this video is going up, I'm out of them, but I have ordered more. <laughs> so they will be on their way and I will stock those back in the shop as soon as they arrive. So let's get spinning. I am going to take this wool and just wrap it around, wrap it around and around. While I spin, I untwist it, I turn it around in my hand, I, you know, switch it around. Uh, however I need to to keep it coming off or I flip it around like this you know um, whatever I need to do to keep it you know coming off nice and organized so I have this bit of floof down here um, to spin from and I have a little bit of wool on the shaft here I'm wondering if I can find the end of it that can be my leader there we go Oh no, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> it was getting caught up in there. Okay. So I'm just gonna, you know, as usual, floof on floof and get that going. You can see this spindle just spins forever and ever and ever. <laughs> it really does and I enjoy this spindle very much. And then while that's just going and going and going, I am drafting and drafting and drafting. Now, I kind of keep it hooked around my pinky finger a little bit so that I have this space right here to draft from, and it kind of prevents the twist from getting up into the wool as I'm drafting, and it, um, it's a little hard to show on camera. So it lets me go. So it lets me have the wool that has the twist in it that's strong and holds up is held up by my pinky as opposed to being held up over here where it doesn't have twist yet and where you know it can't <laughs> have that strength yet until the twist comes into it. Um, so and I, I make a butterfly 
and bring that back up and put it on my spindle, which I feel like it's wound on the wrong way. So I'm gonna, there we go, get that going the right way. There it is, so I can just wind it on there. And I like that the spindle has a little notch cut into it for the yarn to rest in and that prevents it from slipping around the whorl as I'm as I'm spinning so <laughs> that's a really helpful little feature so there we go we are off to a great start on our spindle so let's get ready to hear this wonderful story our story today is by an author you might recognize. His name was A. A. Milne, and he is best known for writing the Paddington Bear stories. This story is called A Hint for Next Christmas. And when I read this, I just laughed out loud. And it doesn't have any particular fiber arts things in it, but I just thought it was funny and I needed to share. So, this is A. A. Milne's A Hint for Next Christmas. There has been some talk lately of the standardization of golf balls, but a more urgent reform is the standardization of Christmas presents. It is no good putting this matter off. Let us take it in hand now so that we shall be in time for next Christmas. My crusade is on behalf of those who spend their Christmases away from home. Last year, I returned with great difficulty from such an adventure, and I am more convinced than ever that Christmas presents should conform to a certain standard of size. My own little offerings were thoughtfully chosen, a matchbox, a lace handkerchief or two, a cigarette holder, a pencil and notebook, gems from Wilcox, and so on. Such gifts not only bring pleasure, let us hope, to the recipient, but take up a negligible amount of room in one's bag and add hardly anything to the weight of it. Of course, if your fellow visitor says to you, how sweet of you to give me such a darling little handkerchief. It's just what I wanted. However did you think of it? You do not reply, well, it was a choice between that and a hundred weight of coal. And I'll give you two guesses why I chose the handkerchief. No. You smile modestly and say, As soon as I saw it, I felt somehow that it was yours. After which you are almost in a position to ask your host casually where he keeps the mistletoe. But it is almost a certainty that the presents you receive will not have been chosen with such care. Probably the young son of the house has been going in for carpentry lately, and in return for your tie pin, he gives you a wardrobe of his own manufacture. You thank him heartily, you praise its figure, but all the time you are wishing that it had chosen some other occasion. Your host gives you a statuette or a large engraving, Somebody else turns up with a large brass candlestick. It is all very gratifying, but you have got to get back to London somehow, and thankful though you are not to have received the boar hound or parrot in cage, which seemed at one time to be threatening, you cannot help wishing that the limits of size for a Christmas present had been decreed by some authority who was familiar with the look of your dressing case. Obviously, too, there should be a standard of value for a certain type of Christmas present. One may give what one will to one's own family or particular friends, that is all right. But in a Christmas house party, there is a pleasant interchange of parcels, of which the string and brown paper and the kindly thought are the really important ingredients, and the gift inside is nothing more than an excuse for these things. It is embarrassing for you if Jones has apologized for his brown paper with a hundred cigars, and you have only excused yourself with twenty-five cigarettes. Perhaps still more embarrassing if it is you who have lost so heavily on the exchange. An understanding that the contents were to be worth five shillings exactly would avoid this embarrassment. And now I am reminded of the ingenuity of a friend of mine, William by name, 
who arrived at a large country house for Christmas without any present in his bag. He had expected neither to give nor to receive anything, but to his horror he discovered on the 24th that everybody was preparing a Christmas present for him, and that it was taken for granted that he would require a little privacy and brown paper on Christmas Eve for the purpose of addressing his own offerings to others. He had wild thoughts of telegraphing to London for something to be sent down, and spoke to other members of the house party in order to discover what sort of presents would be suitable. "'What are you giving to our host?' he asked one of them. "'Mary and I are giving him a book,' said John, referring to his wife. William then approached the youngest son of the house and discovered that he and his next brother Richard were sharing in this, that, and the other. When he had heard this, William retired to his room and thought profoundly. He was the first down to breakfast on Christmas morning. All the places at the table were piled high with presents. He looked at John's place. The top parcel said, to John and Mary from Charles. William took out his fountain pen and added a couple of words to the inscription. It then read, to John and Mary from Charles and William, and in William's opinion looked just as effective as before. He moved on to the next place. To Angela from Father, said the top parcel, and William, wrote William. At his hostess's place, he hesitated for a moment. The first present there was for darling mother from her loving children. It did not seem that an and William was quite suitable, but his hostess was not to be deprived of William's kindly thought. Twenty seconds later, the handkerchiefs from John and Mary and William expressed all the nice things which he was feeling for her. He passed on to the next place. It is, of course, impossible to thank every donor of a joint gift. One simply thanks the first person whose eye one happens to catch. Sometimes William's eye was caught, sometimes not, but he was spared all embarrassment, and I can recommend his solution of the problem with perfect confidence to those who may be in a similar predicament next Christmas. There is a minor sort of Christmas present about which also a few words must be said. I refer to the Christmas card. The Christmas card habit is a very pleasant one, but it too needs to be disciplined. I doubt if many people understand its proper function. This is partly the result of our bringing up. As children, we were allowed, quite rightly, to run wild in the Christmas card shop with one of two results. Either we still run wild, or else the reaction has set in and we avoid the Christmas cards shop altogether. We convey our printed wishes for a happy Christmas to everybody or to nobody. This is a mistake. In our middle age, we should discriminate. The child does not need to discriminate. He has two shillings in the hand and about 24 relations. Even in my time, two shillings did not go far among 24 people. But though presents were out of the question, one could get 24 really beautiful Christmas cards for the money. And if some of them were haypenny ones, then one could afford real snow on a threepenny one for the most important uncle. Meaning by most important, perhaps, but I have forgotten now, the one most likely to be generous in return. Of the fun of choosing those 24 cards, I need not now speak, nor of the best method of seeing to it that somebody else paid for the necessary 24 stamps. But certainly, one took more trouble in suiting the tastes of those who were to receive the cards than the richest and most leisured grown-up would take in selecting a diamond necklace for his wife's stocking or motor cars for his son-in-law. It was not only a question of snow, but also of the words in which the old, old wish was expressed. If the aunt who was known to be fond of poetry did not get something suitable from Eliza Cook, one might regard her Christmas as ruined. How could one grudge the trouble necessary to make her Christmas really happy for her? One might even explore the fourpenny box. But in middle age, by which I mean anything over 20 and under 90, one knows too many people. One cannot give them a Christmas card each. There is not enough powdered glass to go around. One has to discriminate, and the way in which most of us discriminate is either to send no cards to anybody, or else to send them to the first 20 or 50 or 100 of our friends, according to our income and energy, whose names come into our minds. 
Such cards are meaningless, but if we sent our Christmas cards to the right people, we could make the simple words upon them mean something very much more than a mere wish that the recipient's Christmas shall be merry, which it will be anyhow if he likes merriness. A merry Christmas with an old church in the background and a robin in the foreground surrounded by a wreath of holly leaves. It might mean so much. What I feel that it ought to mean is something like this. You live at Potter's Bar and I live at Petersham. Of course, if we did happen to meet at the Marble Arch one day, it would be awfully jolly and we could go and have a lunch together somewhere and talk about old times. But our lives have drifted apart since those old days. It is partly the fault of the train service, no doubt. Glad as I should be to see you, I don't like to ask you to come all the way to Petersham for dinner. And if you asked me to Potter's Bar, well, I should come, but it would be something of a struggle, and I thank you for not asking me. Besides, we have made different friends now, and our tastes are different. After we had talked about the old days, I doubt if we should have much to say to each other. Each of us would think the other a bit of a bore, and our wives would wonder why we had ever been friends at Liverpool, but don't think I had forgotten you. I just sent this card to let you know that I am still alive, still at the same address, and that I still remember you. No need, if we ever do meet, or if we ever want each other's help, to begin by saying, I suppose you have quite forgotten those old days at Liverpool. We have neither of us forgotten, and so let us send to each other once a year a sign that we have not forgotten, and that once upon a time we were friends. A Merry Christmas to you. That is what a Christmas card should say. It is absurd to say this to a man or woman whom one is perpetually ringing up on the telephone, to somebody whom one met last week or with whom one is dining the week after, to a man whom one may run across at the club on almost any day, or a woman whom one knows to shop daily at the same stores as oneself. It is absurd to say it to a correspondent to whom one often writes. Let us reserve our cards for the old friends who have dropped out of our lives and let them reserve their cards for us. But of course we must have kept their addresses, otherwise we have to print out our cards publicly, as I am doing now. Old friends will please accept this, the only intimation. Our lovely fire is winding down and I've been spinning this whole time. So I wanted to let you know, this is how far I got. I've been spinning for about an hour and a half, and I have this much left on my half ounce. I very frequently get the question, how long does it take you to spin? And the answer to this one is, with this spindle, with this fiber, with this yarn, it takes me about two hours to do half an ounce, which means that I will spend four hours spinning up this entire ounce and then a little more to do the ply. Depending on how I do the plying, it could take another hour if it's with spindles, but typically I will ply with a spinning wheel and so that only takes maybe 20 minutes or less if it's yarn like this. So I hope that answers the time question. Ultimately, it depends on the spinner and it depends on the tool and it depends on the fiber and it depends on the yarn. <laughs> so there's a lot there's a lot of factors that can affect it. I also said that I was going to share with you about my next project, so let me grab that so I can hold it up because it's going to be really pretty. I have these yarns. Two of them came in the November Paradise Fibers box, and that was this one, which is already spun up, and it's green, and it has some sparkles in it, and it has a partner, which is kind of a pink, and it also has some sparkles in it. And I spun this up, this was in the January box. It is silver with lots of sparkles in it. And I had these, uh, these two sitting next to each other and then I saw this one next to it and I thought oh, I have some merino that kind of matches this little color story that we have going on here where it's not really a true red it's more of a pink but we do have the sparkly green look at how these go together oh my goodness they look amazing um and then 
these two also go together so well. So I think this is destined to be woven. So maybe I'll do a Christmassy table, table runner and it's going to be a weaving project. I do currently have a project on my loom, so I will need to get that finished. But last year, my big project was Mark's socks, if you remember that whole thing. I'm not sure what it is about me and socks. They just take me forever. They just do. <laughs> I can get a lot of other things done quickly, but socks, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I have to make myself knit through certain sections of it so then I kind of avoid it, so then I procrastinate, so then it just doesn't get done. I guess that's ultimately I guess that's what's behind it but I'm really enjoying weaving lately so I'm not gonna have a hard time getting this on the loom but I thought it would be another fun project just like I was giving you updates with my dress this will be the next one that I can give you updates as I work through it this month besides the daily spins so I have had the question about what and what I'm going to do with all of the Vlogmas spins. So let me know some suggestions. I would love to know what are your ideas for using this yarn, whether you're spinning along with me, whether you've gone into your own stash to do that, or if you're just watching and following along, what are your suggestions for me so far to do with this fireside uh, <laughs> spinning box um, of Vlogmas spins? spins let me know so um yeah that wraps it up for today thank you so much for joining me i'll see you in the next one happy spinning